All right, here we go. Another day, just like that. Another, another, another. <laughs> it's driving me bonkers. So many things to squeeze into a day. It's like you, you just wake up ten minutes later, eating dinner, it's bedtime. It's driving me crazy. I had to abandon my phone for a couple of days. I just can't, I can't deal. <laughs> Overwhelmed with too much stuff. But I'll get caught up. So, here we go. Adventure Doggy and me taking up positions for our morning hour of solitude in here. What are you doing? No, <clears throat> don't do that. What's new on the... I did a podcast with a super good guy from British Columbia. I did a podcast with a guy called The Mindful Hunter on YouTube. A couple hours of nothing but hunting talk. And strictly hunting is a good time. I actually didn't mind doing it because I, I, I don't normally do podcasts. What are you doing? This is a geeky guy. Lie down there, right? Lie down, little one. Big one. No, we're not playing. We should got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> okay. Hold on a minute. All right, there we go. Peace and quiet. The dog's gone. I don't think she wanted to go to the bathroom. I think she just wanted to play. It's so weird. Nobody else in the house but me. She, uh, she just wants to jump around and play and fight with me non-stop. It's fun, but sometimes you can't do it all the time, right? But anyways, yeah, the podcast is a good, good conversation, I felt. I don't normally do, uh, podcasts. I just have it. Probably because I just don't, I don't like talking about myself. I'd rather hear from other people. But anyways, I'll put a link to that in the bottom if you want to take a look at Jay's channel and let's have a listen. You might enjoy it or you might not. Now, on to more important items here. I need to get... I need to get more people heard that have been waiting to be heard. Now, this is titled, no title. Hey Steve, I shared some pictures and a story with you through your ProGuide66 email. I wasn't aware of this email. I wanted to add my own story though. It is weird, and I have others that were there, and it is a bit weird, but you said you wouldn't mind hearing. I've only talked about this with the people involved that day, and my fiance. I was 17. Me and my two good buddies went to Montana for a week-long hiking, floating and whatnot, summertime in July, good fishing in the high lakes, and usually great photography and moose. I got a great pick I'll attach. I was 15 yards away, unarmed with my camera. But I loved climbing and I was invincible at the time. And on our way out, this long road called Lost Horse, back from Bailey Lake, I saw a huge orange, huge orange peak that had a cliff that dropped into the base of the valley exactly how it's typed. <laughs> it looked awesome. It looked like a great spot to try to get to. There was no trail to it though, or that we knew of. For extra detail, the main valley for Lost Horse runs east and west. We are hiking up the north side of the valley on the south facing slope. And to our west, our left, is a smaller valley with a creek that breaks the mountains and goes north and then curves west miles in. Big secluded valley and one entrance basically. So I made a plan with my two friends to just hoof it off trail up the mountain. Boulder fields, cliffy terrain, rock slides. Tough and steep. Patches of steep trees here and there, but not too much. Flat parts as we went up created false peaks too. A little hidden, 100 yard plateaus and such. But we left early the next day, found a parking spot near the base of this rock field and began to boulder hop through the field. We were basically carrying water and knives some 550 feet of cord, and some snacks. Not much, light and fast. I didn't expect it would take more than five hours to do the peak and back, but I was wrong. About halfway up, we all got an eerie feeling as we were going to go through this rock field. I saw a climbable, small 12 to 15 foot cliff and tried to see if I could do it because I was the best climber. I couldn't, so I pushed them to do the rock field. My friend Blake, who was nothing of a climber, jutted straight up this cliff and looked down at us, odd as shit. 
He said he would meet us at the top. And seeing as he was stuck up there now, my buddy Nick and I had to press forward and make sure we meet up with him. Stupid, I know. So Nick and I have to traverse a deep granite wall before making it to the rock field. It was steep and scary, and if you slip, you die. Nick froze up halfway, and I had to talk him through each step to get to me. Ugh, that sucks. I hate that shit. But we made it to the rock field. As we drank water and planned our move up, Nick was freaking out, saying he kept seeing bears in these little outcrop outcroppings on trees. Let me read that, read that one more time smoothly. As we drank water and planned our move up, Nick was freaking out, saying he kept seeing bears in these little outcroppings on trees, like five to ten trees in rocks. I saw nothing. We pressed on, got to a plateau. Nick was not happy, so I made, I made him force a thumbs up and snapped a pick to lighten the mood. We continued up and found Blake halfway to the top, alone in a boulder field. We stopped him and we all kept we stopped him and we all kept going together to the top of the boulder field. As we popped over the ridge, we saw the real peak I wanted I wanted and I snapped a picture. I thought I saw something, but I let it go. It was late though, and just getting here took us too long, but we had lots of time before dark. It was cold at the top and we took a couple pictures. Then we headed down. Rocks seemed to follow us, or be coming down from above. We told ourselves we just disturbed the slope and it happens all the time. But none of us remember 75% of the hike down. None of the three of us. The next thing we all remember, we are panicking. Running through our last rock field before the car and it's getting dark, like 10 o'clock at night. And Blake is so panicked, he almost breaks his leg in the field. We got... We got back, though, when everyone's okay. The next day, Nick doesn't want to leave the house. So Blake and I take another gnarly hike. Come back, and Nick decided to drink for the first time in his life and has 17 beers. Oh, no. He was plastered. So bizarre. When I asked him about the hike, he got weird. And he says he doesn't remember much. Same with Blake, doesn't remember his time alone. And we all don't remember the way down. I looked at the pics and I took, I looked at the pics I took and I found an orb and a thing. I think we popped over this ridge, no one ever climbs and surprised him. Something about us not remembering has something to do with it, I feel. This is the craziest, gnarliest freaking hike the three of us ever did. We should have remembered every detail especially how we got down the granite face we came up. Take a look and tell me what you think. I've seen orbs like these on the river. They're almost clear, but distort the light. On the river, looking from the hill above it, looked black the first time I saw one. The river is almost black, though, that's why. Looked like a basketball flying two feet above the water, with the flow of the river going about 35 miles per hour, maybe more. No picture! But I've got the email. Give me a minute. I'll go into my inbox right now and I'll see if I can find this and find the photos. Okay, so I found a just search on all my emails. And I found one with a couple of photos, but I don't think it's of an orb. Excuse me. Found a few emails, emails from this, from uh, Christopher. So anyways, I'll continue reading and here's the second one. Or maybe one of the first ones. Steve, I have a couple of stories if you would like. You're probably flooded with them, though, so I understand if you don't read this. But I've been watching your channel on YouTube for before, far before you brought Sasquatch up. It's amazing you're coming forward with this. I was very close with an older mentor whose stories I could write a book on. But I'd like to share with you a story I was told by him before he passed away. Probably not of the ordinary for you. I've been going to the Bitterroot Valley in Montana since I was 12. I grew up as a surfer in California, in Orange County, but I really love the outdoors. Oh, damn it. Hold on. Sorry. I just lost my spot. I hate that. I gravitated toward hunting and fishing and survival. My family had befriended a chainsaw artist in town soon after we started going up there, though. Older guy had two purple hearts from Vietnam. 
ran from the feds for a while to save himself and his wife. Long story. Name was Sam Williams, a real legend. He is an old Hell's Angel chapter leader too, but older and straight now. He took me under his wing and showed me a thing or two. I'm still friends with his son today. Sam spent every single day in the woods cutting wood for carvings or firewood. But way back in the Skalkaho forest where good timber was. Big timber for carving, etc. He told me a story when I was 18 and here, here it goes. Sam was about 30 miles back in the logging road and had been cutting all day. He kept getting weird feelings all day and thought maybe a cat was watching him or something. He had weird things happen in this area before too. But basically he cut and loaded all the way until light was almost gone. Then he went back. Then he went to pack up and leave. His wife was with him there too. She would go and help him load smaller rounds. So they went to start driving out from their site and one of these things walked right in front of their truck and looked right at them. Sam said he thought it was a bear standing up until it turned its head and he didn't see a snout. They said it was a very uneasy feeling and it was definitely not a bear. He's also seen weird UFO activity in that area and unexplainable sounds. He said there was something spiritual about certain occurrences. Weird things that seemed to relate. Like it followed him. Not sure what he really meant. But I got a bunch more stories from him. The worst stories I heard didn't have to do with Sasquatch. More of the good and the evil battle that you speak of. I've seen a couple things too in the Bitterroot. But it was tech for sure. I could see the pilots. Got another one from an old ranger too. 40 years as a ranger in designated wilderness areas. Few from him actually. A few from him actually if you want them. I know you got tons. Anyway, that's how Sam opened the topic to me. His first experience. I have a couple more stories I heard from my time in Montana and from others too. I worked in Montana at a rare earth mine as a chemist for a few years. I've heard stories and I've always done what you are suggesting, I would regularly ask people who I felt comfortable with about the Sasquatch phenomena and other things that commonly happen up there. Just asking will bring laughs sometimes, so I'm cautious, but it is amazing how common it is, how common it is that someone gives me an honest response. I love what you're doing, and I'll be following up on the videos. Keep talking. There's something going on. I tell my fiancé that I can feel it global, beyond us. Thanks again, Chris. And then I found another email from Chris. Steve, I'm watching your videos and I have to berate you with one more story I heard. I was on a camping trip with an older family friend named Sam. Me and my two best friends and Sam's best friend, whose name I forget now. I met, I met him the once. Sam's best friend was a longtime ranger, 40 years of service. He would hike for weeks in what they call designated wilderness looking for people hiding out or poachers. He said he was on the tracks of this one guy for days, and when he caught up to him and spotted him, it was a man dressed in furs and carrying a black powder rifle. He said he spoke to him and he didn't know English, but he also told me that the man in furs told him it was his father's gun. So they talked. No details if the gun worked, but this guy had one. This would have been the 1980s and in Northwest U.S. I want to say Idaho, but I forget. He said the guy walked off, though. He brought the story up during a discussion about Sasquatch, but never said it was a Sasquatch. He said it was a man in furs, and he was specific about the black powder rifle. He did say the guy was big, but didn't exaggerate or specify. In my mind, hearing the story, you may be pictured... You, you maybe pictured someone about six foot nine from his hand gesture, but he didn't say. Just that he spoke with the man and he didn't speak English. Kind of weird. And he thought it was related to our Sasquatch discussion. That is kind of odd. I'll read that again. Just that he spoke with the man and he didn't speak English. Hmm. He whipped out some newspaper clippings on Sasquatch and some he had details about some areas. Claimed certain places were bad and not, not to go there. He saw a silver disc once sitting basically in the forest. A big thing. Then, as if 
He knew. He saw it. It lifted and was out of there. I've seen stuff like that myself. Never Sasquatch, though, but those old timers were all over the place with stories that night. Basically, don't think you know everything, like you were saying. Hope it was at least worth reading. Love your channel, Chris. Of course it's worth reading, Chris. Every time, man. Well, almost every time. <laughs> now, if you got some more, my man, since it sounds like you've been doing some digging, and I love that you're hearing, you're listening to um, our outdoor employed community as well as the senior community, right? We want to hear it all. Now, you caught something on a photo. I'll save these images. I'll put them into the video. We'll have a look together. You thought maybe it's something quite odd, which it looks like it probably is, but unfortunately it's a little pixelated once you zoom in. But that is definitely, from what I can tell with this photo, whatever that black item is, um, it would not be roots or root ball because there's just no timber along that height of land the same size at all. And then what this is like, this is exactly what it looked like when I'm when I'm hunting mountain sheep and I'm sitting back with my binoculars, I'm staring. And the first thing I do is if I see something I think might be something odd, I look all around to see if there's another rock or rocks the same color, which will help eliminate me thinking it's something, you know, a piece of a game animal or something. So I'm looking around. There's nothing that color on that mountain anywhere else. Not even the shadow. Well, the shadow's somewhat, but it's not possible to get a shadow up on top of that height of land, right? Is it a tree? No. It dwarfs the uh, the tiny trees. What is it? I haven't a clue. Is it something? For sure. <laughs> there you go. That's all I can really say about it. But anyway, appreciate you sending that in, Chris. If you want to send more, man, send us more. All right? You got a lot of stories but from what it sounds like. And uh, I want to hear them. I definitely want to hear them. Now... Montana's on fire, is it not? Montana is on fire. With, with sightings in the backcountry. Now, what's this one? This is titled, Shushwap and BC Interior Stories. All right, the backyard again. Hello, Steve, I appreciate your important work and honesty. It's not easy to be the liaison for so many individuals. Your candor and straightforward approach to all things is refreshing. I appreciate the kind words. I live in the interior of BC and moved from the lower mainland in my mid-twenties to start wakeboard school. I grew up visiting popular sites such as Harrison Lake and Golden Ears slash Alouette Lake, camping in the coastal mountains, Seymour, Belcara, etc. I learned to appreciate the outdoors and majestic beauty of province. I even camped out in a Quincy I built as a Boy Scout. I never feared the wilderness, but formed a respect for all forms of life. We had a cabin at Paul Lake in Kamloops, passed down through generations, where I learned all things water sports and still share my passion today. I've always had an interest in the existence of life forms, known and unknown. After all, life is abundant, and we can see for ourselves the sheer diversity in nature. My grandmother, who survived World War II Germany, taught me many truths about the world, and enlightened me about people such as Edgar Cayce and others, as she had multiple near-death near -death experiences, and would tell me about what she learned on the other side. She also came to me a week before 9-11 in a dream and told me she was in New York on a plane. There were people who needed her help. I had many apparitions after her death in the late 90s. Needless to say, I have an open mind and open heart. Fast forward to recent years. As a result of my wakeboarding endeavors, I started providing outreach and sport to the indigenous tribes throughout my region. I've asked many people within these groups if they have seen anything strange in the forest. I've also turned many to your channel. And I am floored by the responses. But many people do not wish to talk openly about such things. However, they know me and have explained how close they live to these forest people. Barrier BC has one of the largest uranium deposits in North America. Maybe a coincidence, I don't know, but interesting to note. 
towards Green Mountain, many hunters have taken notice of tribes of Sabe, and they would try to get closer to investigate. They quickly find the Sabe have moved into a new valley or an adjacent range. For many years, the indigenous people would not share any of these details. However, I was told that word got out, and someone in a professional organization chartered these hunters to take them out and look. The hunters didn't want to completely cooperate, but did eventually take a group, the BSR, the BSRO, out to try and locate them. I was told that in Lillooet in 2019, a female Sabe and her children walked out in front of a bus full of school children on a reservation as they were boarding the school bus. It was as if she was just casually taking the kids to school. These communities tend not to report such instances for fear of further ridicule. I don't know if they fear the ridicule. I think they just know it's a waste of time to talk to the, we'll call it, we'll just say the Europeans about it because you know the typical reaction. But on side note, around that same time, just over the hill, is where I was doing a job for a friend near Mount Curry, and they and a large male Sasquatch blatantly walked right across the road by the corner store on the train tracks in front of everybody. Probably about the same time. A good mountaineering friend of mine frequents the Monashies and winters there. He was that so the Monashies are gonna be south of Vernon, a ways back down, south of Lumbee. He was tending to his cabin mid-fall with a friend and saw a giant green fireball in the sky slow down on its descent into the range north of them. Middle of the night, these lunatics with headlamps, lol, run to the top of the mountain to see if there was a smoldering bushfire. And when they crested the mesa and looked into the basin, they were shocked to see a bipedal hominid ascending the mountain across from them. As they rushed for a better view, they came across a fully tactical sniper who was very shocked that he had been discovered by two forest hippies with headlamps. He was trained on his target when they approached. He warned them off of the mountain, and as they left in their vehicle, there were eight black Tahoes coming up the logging road. I have a firm mindset that seeing is believing. Quote, once you cross the threshold from being a believer to being an experiencer, there is no turning back, end quote. Hence the club and no return. My experiences have been clear enough that I didn't need to take a photo, even when my phone was in my pocket. It was for me. And will forever remind me that not everything is as it seems or is taught outside of fairy tales or the National Enquirer. I saw one of BC's largest billboards, seven by 55 feet, telephone poles strapped 15 feet apart. It's very large. I use a man lift to change the crate to change the creative annually. It was a super sunshining summer day at noon on the nose. The wind was at my back and the roaring intersection of cars behind me. I was 30 feet off the ground by myself, counting the screws I had to pull when I noticed above me a spherical object the size of an old VW Beetle. It looked as though it was a pure white object that had, that had riled in the Kamloops dirt. A very destructive color that you find yourself covered in after mount, mountain biking all day. Oh, I gotcha. The wind was so intense that I couldn't change the paddles. And this thing was just hovering in the 70 kilometer winds without a sound. I watched for five minutes as it flew over the intersection and up over the Husky gas station. Up to Mount Paul, where a second object of the exact same size came out and orbited the first object. After two or three orbits, the departed one went south and the other went east. Oh, they, they departed. One went south and one went east. I had my phone in my pocket the entire time and even though, and, and even thought about taking a picture, but in my head, I said, no, this experience is for me. In years prior, I used to teach wakeboard lessons at Sunny Bray Bible Camp for a few weeks a year. One time, as a storm was coming in, I was tying my boat up on the buoy and back paddling to the dock. There were two storm systems, one coming from the south and another from the east, and they were converging right over Salmon Arm and Mount Ida, a volcano. Between the two storm systems popped an object out of the clouds. 
It traversed the blue sky between the storm systems above Mount Ida. This object looked like an airplane with no wings and was flying sideways and was clearly a cylinder with windows. I had about two minutes to watch this object and was fascinated. I know there is much, much more to this world and it makes me fearful. Raising my children to take them out into the wilderness as I did as a youth. I spent so much time in the water that I've also heard many large serpent stories. Even a video last year out of the shoe shop that showed a giant snake looking creature on the surface of the water. No shit. I should send that over. I got a lot of friends that live around there. Chase and Sorrento. I also attached a screenshot that I took myself from Google Earth in the early years where I believe there is an object that looks like an Ogo Pogo that measures over 120 feet long. I've thought about sharing. Sorry, I've thought about starting an underwater YouTube channel. The hunt for Ogo Pogo, LOL. Two summers ago, my wife and I were having a houseboat party at the famous Nielsen Beach in the Shushwap. This place is Boat Vegas. If you've never been, I encourage you to come and have a holiday, as my wakeboard school brings me out many weekends of the summer for charters slash bachelorette and bachelor parties. I decided to buy a houseboat. We were on our first camp in our new boat, and it was the middle of the night. There were 300 people partying on the beach. My wife noticed down the beach and up towards the tree line, there were several trees where the tops were shaking violently from side to side. It was pitch black, and there's no way somebody's climbing those trees. People are very enamored and not thinking about their surroundings by the sheer isolation of the beach and the massive party. I now realize could draw in a lot of spectators. Often we'd park our boat further down the beach so we could have some peace and quiet during the wee hours, but that meant we either take the boat in the dark back and forth or climb through the forest. To say the least, we chose the latter. I'll keep compiling stories for you as I come across them. I have some more of my own as well. Thank you for everything you do for this community. I'd like to think that I was definitely one of your earlier subscribers and all the best. The place marker shows the creature and the dot by the A in the place mark is a 20 foot boat. Okay, what am I looking at? Look at boats. Oh, look at that. That's weird, isn't it? How the hell did you find that? That's really creepy, whatever that is. Who knows? Who knows, right? I mean, it's a Google Earth picture, but who knows what it is? It could even be a, an oil slick bilge, kind of a bigger boat. Who knows? I don't know, but that's that's definitely something else to discover on Google Earth. They'll share it, and you've added in the houseboats for reference as well, right? Yeah, I'm familiar with all all of that. The uh, the shoe swap party scene. I never ever went myself. Obviously, know a lot of people that have, and it's definitely there's nothing but chaos stories that come back from those uh, party weekends on the infamous party Shushwap Lake party zone. And there you go. Appreciate you sending all that in, man. And you got more, uh, you got anything that's gonna help anybody too? Send it in. Somebody wants to get it off the chest or, or uh, locate, whatever. You got something that you think may be of interest to the people here through me, get it to me, man, all right? Get it to me. Who's, who else? This is titled, Story Coming From Me. Steve, my story. I could use any explanation or help you could offer as I'm not sure why this is happening to me now. I have a couple ideas that I won't mention. I'd like an unbiased opinion. This starts with my good friend who I grew up with. We're both country guys from a rural farm area. He lives on a small gentleman's farm, maybe 25 acres or something like that. He had a purchased, he had purchased a duck for his pond and it came up missing. He assumed he got taken by a coyote. I received a call to see if I wanted to come over and try to call in some coyote and shoot them. I'm not an experienced coyote hunter. 
but between the two of us, we had hunted and harvested about everything that lives in our area, and I was pretty eager to get a coyote and make his pond safe again. I went over on a Sunday night, and bought some and brought some calling equipment and a red light mounted to my scope and a 22 mag that I had just sighted in. He had a couple of other friends over and his family was there. There was a fire in the fire pit and everyone was enjoying each other's company. When it got dark, we put out the collar and sat beside the truck that was in his back field. After about half an hour with no noise or action, we went back to the fire pit but left the collar going. Excuse me. After about 30 minutes later, we went back to the truck, sat down, and scanned the area with the red light. My friend noticed what seemed to be a road reflector in a brush pile he had made. I couldn't see it, so he handed me the gun with the light on it. Then I could see it clearly, but he couldn't. He was adamant that he didn't have any reflectors or road signs in the brush pile. At this point, the fact that he kept saying that didn't register to me, or the fact that only the person with the light could see the reflector. We sat there for about 20-25 minutes scanning the area. Then he said, fur, but I didn't see anything. He told me where to shine the light, and it was about 70 yards to the left of where the reflector had been, and just about 10 yards in the woods, right behind his camper trailer, and the reflector wasn't there anymore. He seemed sure he had seen something, but couldn't tell me if it was a coyote or not. Then I noticed another reflector right where he said he saw the fur. It was about nine and a half feet high, right beside the large tree. A large tree. My friend and I both started to feel a little confused, and just not ourselves. But this is very difficult to explain. After about five minutes, he said he was going back to the house. I assumed he wanted to have a cigarette or something. I stayed out there and continued to scan the woods and kept going to the reflector. After about 20 minutes in, I noticed the reflector blink. Yes, blink. But I was not scared at all. I was confused. I kept getting a thought that this was an owl or a bobcat. Very odd to explain why I thought this as well. I finally thought that whatever it is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out. I took the rifle off the safety and said to myself, I'm going to shoot it. And I'll know what it is. I prepared to shoot, and as I exhaled and squeezed the trigger, the trigger, sorry, one more time. I had prepared to shoot, and as I exhaled and squeezed the trigger, I got a thought in my head that said, quote, don't shoot, it's a man, end quote. Understand, I didn't think this came into my head literally a fraction of a second before the gun would have fired. I took my finger off the trigger and contemplated what the F just happened. I still felt no fear and continued to scan the woods. About five or ten minutes later, I heard something huge breaking through the woods. I never saw it except for that one eye. Also, the red light didn't seem to affect it. That night, he asked me not to say anything to his wife and I agreed, but told her there was a bobcat or owl in the tree. He and I didn't talk or see each other, for over two months. I finally reached out to him and asked if he felt confused that night and asked what was in the woods that night. And he didn't want to talk about it much, but said there was something huge in the woods and that he actually saw its legs walking to the tree that night. <clears throat> Excuse me. He once again made me promise not to mention this was to his wife. Later that year, I was ginseng hunting and, and hunting groundhogs. I saw a black figure next to a small leafy tree about 700 yards away. I blew it off until some kids ride up the path beside it on a four-wheeler and it ran away before they got to it. About seven months later, I was with a young family member about 400 miles away hunting morel mushrooms in a state forest. This place is usually packed with other mushroom hunters and park rangers drive through about every hour. It's a similar it is similar traffic here as if it's deer gun season in a rural area. This year there were no mushrooms at all, and almost no mushroom hunters. I decided to go back in the woods about half a mile. I had found mushrooms before. We both heard an owl hoot twice. I didn't think much of it, and we kept going back and looking for the owl. 
Then we both heard a horrible turkey call. Then we heard it again about 40 yards away. Then it hit me. There aren't any owls hooting in the middle of the day, and that isn't a turkey. It was just a horrible imitation of a turkey call. My young family member who insisted that we see what it was. Oh, sorry. My young family member was insistent that we see what it was. I had to grab him and force him to leave with me. And then we had to walk a half a mile to the road. Very nerve wracking. Then about a year later, I was in one of the largest cities in the U.S. inside the inner beltway at a park, let's just say. I was with three generations of my family. We we're walking on a path and we saw a tree shaking about 40 yards away. We couldn't make out what was shaking in the tree. Sorry, we couldn't make out what was shaking the tree. I told the other man with me to go with me to see what it was. For some reason, he wouldn't go with me. So I hesitated. I got the same feeling it was a bobcat again. A few seconds later, I went by myself to investigate while my family watched, and there was nothing there, no one around. I waited a couple of minutes and then went back to the path, but never saw anything. And everyone just wrote it off. I can't get over it, though, in the city. Those are my experiences in the past couple of years. Before this, I don't ever recall anything and spent a lot of time outside in the woods. I'd really like to know why now and why so often. I'm very leery of going out anymore. It seems like these things have some sort of interest in me. I don't care if you read this, but I don't think it's YouTube material. The only reason I want you to use my name is that I promised my friend I wouldn't tell his wife about it. Sorry, the only reason I don't want you to use my name is that I promised my friend I wouldn't tell his wife about it. I would really just like some insight to this if you can give me any. Please reply. My cousin actually ran into one of these about a mile from my house 40 years ago. He was young, about 11 or so, and his dad told him he saw a bear, and not to mention it to anyone. He didn't want anyone to think his son was crazy. My cousin was scared half to death, and he's forced not to tell anyone. Real shame. To this day, I still haven't heard the whole story. Thanks. Blank, I'll leave all your name, man. There you go. First off, I appreciate you coming forward. You're brave and honest man. You're a brave and honest man. Welcome to the club. Although, it's one of those clubs you might not have wanted to join, but you had no choice, and now you can't escape it. What are my insights? I don't know. I don't know why. If you want to talk patterns, that's a pattern. There is a lot of people who spent a lifetime in the woods professionally. They live there. They just love to go there. Either one. And uh, their whole lives. You know, like how many times you hear, well, I was a park ranger and I was a logger for 35 years. Never seen anything. And all of a sudden these things are in my yard. I said, how many people now? And as you know, if you've been sitting here listening for any, any, any amount of time, um, as I'm looking in the forest, I see some weird black shape I've never seen before. Anyway, if you've been here any amount of time, I don't know. Are, are people tagged? Maybe, possibly. But it seems that once whatever these people, whoever these people are, once they know that you know they exist, they're here, they keep reminding you. <laughs> right? But I don't know why. I don't know why someone could be on a rural property for frickin' two or three generations and then all of a sudden shit starts flying. I don't know what's up with that. Will we find out? As long as we don't quit, we're going to find out. As long as we keep talking, we're going to find out. If we stop talking, we're not going to find out. All right? That's the key. We have to keep speaking. No matter how repetitive some impatient people might think it is because they come here for entertainment or some damn thing. Oh, we're just spinning our wheels. No, you are spinning your wheels. You are spinning your wheels if that's the feeling you have. There is literally millions of people coming here a month to listen to the people speak while they go on their this crazy journey of life, gathering information, knowledge that they need. That's definitely not spinning wheels. But anyway, I'm starting to babble. We gotta, we gotta keep talking. We have to keep speaking. 
And if somebody stops us from speaking here, we got to figure out another route to keep speaking and not quit. I don't have quit in me. <laughs> I do not have quit in me. I actually have the opposite and I have a lot of fight in me. That's a bit of a stubborn combination, right? To make sure this shit keeps going on. Anyway. And I assure you there is a lot going on off of this camera. All right? There's a lot going on off of this camera when it comes to this topic and me and other people. Okay? So there you go for now. I got to get moving. Share my story at howtohunt.com. And if that doesn't work, because it keeps getting clogged up and it takes forever to free up some space, what's the other one? Tell my story at howtohunt.com. Either one of those will get your knowledge, your important information, whatever you got, that will get it shared with the people word for word here. All right? There you go. What else? What else? What else? What else? Sarah's doing her next shop for hungry children on this Tuesday. Reason being, there's some special day at the grocery store where you get more points and better discounts or something. I don't know. You know, she's a professional shopper. So, so that's going down on Tuesday. What else? The Mindful Hunter podcast is where I babbled on for a couple hours about hunting. You can watch that. I'll put a link for that at the bottom. Sarah still has a handful of items left in her store she wants to get rid of before she cracks open something new and exciting. But that's about it. Now, get my ass in gear. Getting my ass in gear. I'll be back tomorrow, no matter what.